On behalf of uh, the League of Women Voters of the Ribbon Area and the Five County Tobacco Free Coalition, we would like to invite, uh, we would like to welcome you to the candidate forum for the 52nd Assembly District. A couple of things, I'd like you all to turn your cell phones off now. Thank you. We don't want anything to interrupt the important information that the candidates are going to give us tonight. Also, want to remind you that this is a forum. It is not a debate. A forum is for informational purposes. The candidates, if they so choose, may take some time out of their two minutes to answer questions to respond to something. But this is not a debate format. It is a forum. Both candidates for the 42nd Assembly District were invited to participate, and we are delighted to have both here this evening. Thank you for attending, and thank you for running for office. It is not always easy. Before we begin with our program, I wanted to share that the League and the Tobacco Free Coalition encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in their government work to increase understanding of major policy issues and address public policy through education and advocacy. The League was founded in 1920 by Carrie Chapman Catt, who was born in the city of Ripon and in Fond du Lac County. The League has been in existence for nearly 100 years. The Fond du Lac County Tobacco Prevention and Control Coalition was founded in 1992 under the leadership a former Fond du Lac County Health Officer, Diane Capazzo, and became a multi-jurisdictional coalition covering Fond du Lac, Green Lake, Marquette, Washera, and Washington counties in 2010. Thank you to both the City of Fond du Lac and Fond du Lac County for allowing us to utilize the legislative chambers. Thank you also to the Fond du Lac County Sheriff's Office for the officer they have provided for tonight's event. This forum is being live streamed and recorded for the Fond du Lac Public Access Channel for replay. This session will provide voters of the 52nd Assembly District information on each of the candidates, allowing voters to make informed decisions. Before we review the format for tonight's forum, let me explain the concept of this evening. We are here to listen to the candidates. The audience does not speak. You may ask questions through the written word. Good communication requires listening, and listening is 90% of communication. The candidates have drawn for position. We will wait while someone turns their phone off. The candidates have drawn for position and will present in the order of the draw. Jeremy Thiesfeld has drawn for position one, and so he will begin tonight with opening remarks. Each candidate will have up to two minutes for those opening remarks, and up to two minutes to answer each question. Closing remarks will be limited to one minute. The lead will change following opening remarks. Audience questions are encouraged. Please write them on cards. You've all seen these. Write your questions on cards provided. Hold the card up and uh, an usher will collect the questions. Ushers, can you raise your hands? The ushers are back there right now. Gary is up here. So if you have it, raise the card up and they will come back. <coughs> Our screeners are in the front row here. Our timers are on the other side of the front row also. Select questions will be answered by both candidates. You may not write a question directed at one, uh, one candidate. We will not use it. We are here to learn what both the candidates feel and believe on it on issues. So, with that, Mr. Fisco, would you please begin? Timers, are you ready? Okie doke. Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to begin by thanking the audience for coming tonight. Clearly, there are many other places you could be and things you could be doing tonight, but instead you chose to be here. Uh, so whether you're supporting Kevin or you're supporting me or you're here just simply to inform your vote on November 6th, you deserve to be commended for your civic engagement. I uh, also, of course, would like to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Ellen for moderating uh, the five-county 
Coalition for their sponsorship of the event. Uh, I also would like to thank my family, uh, my wife of 28 years. Cindy is sitting in here somewhere. Uh, she has been through me through a number of elections and public service over the years and has been a strong support source behind the scenes. Also, my five children, none of which could be here tonight. Now, some of you might say five. I thought he had four children. Well, I was able to add a son to the family this last summer when my oldest daughter was married. Uh, and just to show how open-minded I am, he's a Cubs fan. <laughs> Now, he's in mourning right now, so I'm not going to talk any more about that here this evening. Uh, but I truly appreciate the support from my family. I was born in Fond du Lac. And unfortunately, when I was very young, I had to move away because of my father's job. Uh, those of you who know me know I have many older brothers and sisters. And I grew up most of my life listening to how, what a wonderful place Fond du Lac was to grow up. Well, in 1999, uh, I was in my teaching years, and I had the opportunity to come back to Fond du Lac and teach at one of my Lutheran Academy. And I must say that we jumped at that opportunity, and it was one of the best decisions that my wife and I ever made. What a great family-friendly community this is, and it's been such an honor for me to be able to serve all of you in the state legislature and for that on the city council. Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, first and foremost, I want to thank the League of Women Voters uh, for organizing this event and all the work that you do each and every day. I also want to thank Jeremy for participating this evening and all of you for taking the time out of your night to be here and join us. Like Jeremy mentioned, there's, there's a lot of other things you could be doing, and the fact that you chose to spend it with us is, is important. Uh, my name is Kevin Booth. I am honored and humbled to be considered for the opportunity to represent you in Madison studied economics at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. I've made a career for myself in the hospitality industry, with experience in restaurants, resorts, and cruise ships. I grew up just down the road on National Avenue. I was the drum captain of the Fondy Marching Cardinals. I earned my very first paycheck washing dishes at Sebastian State now. I'm proud to be from Fond du Lac. I'm doing everything I can to make sure that Fond du Lac County has a representative in Madison that listens to what folks have to say, and turns those ideas into action. As a first-time candidate, I believe I am uniquely qualified for the opportunity for a fresh start for what Wisconsin's next chapter can look like. It's a chapter that prioritizes infrastructure spending to include digital infrastructure so that our rural communities have access to the same high-speed internet we take for granted in town. It's a chapter that embraces new industries and secures Wisconsin as a leader in the renewable energy economy. And it's a chapter that believes Wisconsin, Wisconsinites should not be financially ruined due to an unexpected health condition. This chapter is not a fantasy, it's at our fingertips, but we're going to need new leadership in order to achieve it. I look forward to answering your questions and for you getting to know me a little bit better over the course of the next hour. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You get the first question, and we have lots. So thank you, audience. You've done a good job so far. Um, do you or do you not support the Foxconn subsidy? Why or why not? I do not. Uh, I do not support the Foxconn subsidy. Um, I believe strongly in creating new jobs in Wisconsin and, and, and drawing new industries to our area. Um, but we really need to take a look at how we go about doing that. Um, I believe that the incentive was, was far too great. Um, and I don't think that we're going to get uh, get the full investment back out of it. Um, we can create jobs and be a state that people want to come to and bring their jobs to without um, giving away you know, a 45% uh, subsidy for it. You know, the, the entire project is estimated at about 10 billion, and you know, four and a half million worth of subsidies is is far too much. Um, my father owns his own business. Uh, if you or I open our own business, we, we certainly don't get 45% from the government to do so, and um, I do not support it. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I voted for the Foxconn project. Now, if you were to go deep into the heart of my political ideology, I would just assume that government would stay out of all private business. However, uh, one of the things that I have changed my mind on over the years is, is that uh, government can have a positive impact in this area. And we have example of that right here in Fond du Lac with Mercury Marine. Uh, the 
Foxconn project was basically the Mercury Marine deal multiplied obviously much larger. Um, much of what was accomplished with that uh, was studied when this deal was put together. Uh, I supported the Mercury Marine deal and that clearly has had many benefits for our community here. Uh, there have been numerous uh, building projects that have about doubled their workforce. Now, Foxconn project, uh, we're talking 13,000 jobs. And we're not just talking the run-of-the-mill manufacturing like you might find across the state of Wisconsin. This is an effort that is groundbreaking. It is the largest economic development uh, program in United States history. And not only are we going to see 13,000 jobs, and yes, there are tax incentives for that, but these are not given out unless the jobs are done. Uh, it's pay as you grow, not pay as you go, pay as you grow. And so they have to do, they have to hire the people before there are going to be any kind of incentives uh, given to them. Uh, as far as the return on the investment, there was a study that was done that showed that for every dollar the state is going to invest, there's an anticipation of up to $18 that could be coming back to the state in terms of economic uh, growth. Uh, this is a groundbreaking project for the state of Wisconsin. It puts us on the map in a whole new kind of uh, manufacturing that we have not had before. Okay, thank you. Now, some of these questions are going to get a little long. And if you need me to repeat them, just ask and I'm happy to do so. So Jeremy, you're going to start with this one. The 52nd Assembly District is in the Lake Michigan watershed. Do you believe in taking action to protect the watershed or protecting the Great Lakes from those out west who repeatedly ask to divert water from them to the west? I suppose that would somewhat matter what you mean by the west. Uh, Arizona. Okay, that's, that's a little different than, say, um, Montello. Yeah. Uh, so if, if we're talking western states, uh, no. I, I, the people who moved out into those areas un understood what they were getting into when they moved out there. Uh, we are blessed with great water resources in the Midwest, particularly the state of Wisconsin. Uh, you, there, there's a, a mural inside the state assembly at the Capitol in, in the chambers there. and. On the mural, there are three ladies that represent three bodies of water, Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, and Lake, uh, excuse me, and uh, Mississippi River. And so our, our lives, particularly in, here in Fond du Lac, with Lake Winnebago and Mercury Marine, uh, very much of it revolves around the use of the water um, for recreational purposes. So it, water is essential for life, obviously, and it's essential for our way of life here in this community and this state. And we ought to do our best to protect it. Uh, as far as diverting it away from the Lake Michigan watershed, uh, I, I, I suspect that the question is somewhat aimed at the fact that this has happened in Waukesha. Uh, there, because Waukesha had the same issue that Fond du Lac had, and this was when I was on the city council where we were looking at a problem with radium in our drinking water, and Waukesha had radium in the drinking water, and they, it was so incredibly expensive to get it out that they asked for permission to divert a little bit of water away from Lake Michigan. I don't see any problem with something like that. I think that was good for the people of Waukesha to be able to have that opportunity uh, because they were in a very difficult position in being able to come up with the water because of some changes that were passed in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah, so I don't think it much matters as to where it comes from. You know, if it came from out west, I don't think that's necessarily critical to the question. The question is about if we should be protecting our water or not. And I think that obvious answer is yes. Um, and promoting projects like Foxconn are certainly not the way to go about that. Um, there were several exceptions made and given to Foxconn to pollute and not follow the same rules that uh, other businesses along the lake are forced to follow. So um, I don't think Foxconn is doing a good job of that. I think uh, Jeremy's correct that our Great Lakes are incredibly precious resources. Um, not just us here in the Midwest, but the, the whole world knows about the Great Lakes and, and what an important freshwater resource that is. Um, so now there's companies all around the world 
that know that we opened ourselves up to that and we've allowed an overseas corporation to come in and tap into the Great Lakes. And I, I think that sets a very dangerous precedent. Um, and there's a lot of companies that would be interested in using the Great Lakes and somebody's gonna wanna build a factory uh, along the lakes in Michigan, along the lakes in Indiana, or I'm sorry, not Indiana, Ohio, and we're gonna have no footing to stand on and tell them that they can't or that they're abusing the water resource because we've done it first. So um, I don't think this is a good way to protect our resources. Okay, we have a follow-up question from the audience regarding water, and we'll start with Kevin. Does Wisconsin have adequate protection for drinking water? Sorry, can you repeat that? Does, does Wisconsin have adequate protection for drinking water? I think we should always be striving to do more. Um, I mean, adequate, I, I would say yes. I mean, with adequate protection, sure, but I think we can always be doing more, and we should be pushing that um, to the greatest extent that we can. Okay. Jeremy. Uh, the drinking water question? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, yeah, I, I would agree that, yes, we certainly are, we have good systems here. We, we don't want to have any kind of crisis such as they had in Michigan and in Florida. Uh, and I, I can tell you that when I was on city council in Fond du Lac, we had to implement some new systems in drinking water. Uh, and it was going to cost the citizens of the city an awful lot. I mean, those of you in this room can remember paying water bills before about 2005. And then after that, know that there was significant increase. Uh, and that that was something that came down from the federal government. And I worked hard to make sure that our citizens in this community, that we came up with a water system that was going to be as effective as possible and also as affordable as possible. Uh, certainly, we should always look to make the water cleaner. Um, the area around Fond du Lac, as I said before, is rich in water resources. Uh, we have a bit of an unusual situation here in that we are not drawing our water from a lake. We're drawing it, or from other body of water, we're drawing it from underground wells. Uh, and I think the citizens of the city appreciate that. And I was happy to be able to keep us from having to draw water from Lake Winnebago. Um, we love Lake Winnebago, but I don't think too many of us are interested in drinking water out of it. And that was something that was slated a number of years back. Okay, this is another long one, and you're gonna I'm up. start. It's you. <laughs> Please share your opinion on the school voucher program. Do you support public money being used to fund private schools? If private schools accept public money, should they be required to adhere to the same standards as public schools? If not, isn't that a double standard? All right, well, let me see if I can remember all that. If, if I forget one of those parts, you'll count I, I will help you. Uh, the voucher system, I, uh, or school choice, or different names for it. Uh, essentially what you have here is, is a scholarship for low-income students to be able to go to a school of their choice. Uh, we have scholarships of this nature all over the place in our society. You could essentially look at Medicaid and Medicare as being something similar to that. You're being given some money from the government, you're allowed to go spend it in certain places. Uh, Fond du Lac community has a few schools that are in the uh, school choice program, and I think that's a positive thing for our community. Uh, the schools that are in this program are subject to uh, taking the, the tests for the students that are uh, that get the, get the vouchers, and those tests are produced publicly. Uh, just a few days ago, there was a report that came out on the testing in the state, and the voucher students were included with that. I think it's a positive thing for our state to have so many different ways that our parents can examine in order to be able, excuse me, to, be able to effectively educate their children. Uh, it's not just, <clears throat> not just public school. Uh, but it's also homeschool options, private school options, private school that um, implement the choice program. All of those are things that we can look at. Um, and charter schools is another one that's in there. Uh, this is a good opportunity for us to improve education in the state. Uh, the voucher schools have been successful. The statistics have proven that. Doesn't mean every single one of them is, is doing great work. 
or the single public school isn't doing great work either. The evidence shows that as well. But we are giving people an opportunity to go to a school, send their children to a school that works best for them. Thank you. Do you need me to repeat it, Kevin? If you don't mind. Please share your opinion on the school voucher program. Do you support public money being used to fund private schools? If private schools accept public money, should they be required to adhere to the same standards as public schools? If not, isn't that a double standard? Yeah, my opinion uh, is that public dollars should not be going to, to private schools. Um, like the question states, you know, there, there isn't the transparency that it deserves. And the transparency people are looking for are not the test scores. The transparency people are looking for is how those dollars get spent. Um, you know, I, I like that we have choices in, in the state for education. I like that we have different options. But uh, public dollars simply belong in the public domain. And, and sending them to a private school where we are no longer able to see how those dollars get spent or allocated uh, is wrong. Um, I think private schools are, are just fine to exist and have options, but they, they shouldn't be funded through the, the public tax dollars. Our public schools are currently not being funded properly or fully, and we're just splitting, we're splitting the, the dollar uh, two ways by, by trying to fund, by inadequately funding two different education systems. So it would be a double standard to answer that part of the question um, to fund them and not allow the transparency. Okay. So you get the next question, it's a short one. I'll save the long ones for you, Jeremy. <laughs> Do you believe there are any administrative advantages to reducing the number of counties in Wisconsin? Why or why not? That's the first time I've heard that. So these are questions from the, from the audience, and the, correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's the first time I've heard that. That's an interesting proposition. Um, I don't see any current uh, concerns or problems with the number of counties that we have. I have not heard from anybody that there should be more or less of them. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure, maybe I don't understand the question correctly. No, that's the question. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't see any advantages or disadvantages to changing the number of counties that we have. And I have not heard that as a, as a concern when I'm knocking doors and talking to people. But if somebody had a proposal, I would I'd be open to hearing it. Jeremy. That is a question that I've heard before. Uh, and it doesn't come up just in terms of counties. It comes up in terms of municipalities, too. I mean, that there, there is discussion constantly over the years of whether of ways that the city of Fond du Lac and the village of North Fond du Lac can sick share services. Uh, as far as combining counties into one, uh, I think that's going to be a tough sell. Uh, but what you could do is, as I said, consolidate services. Uh, there are many things that could be looked at uh, as far as uh, putting together, you know, the, uh, you, you name it, the, the, the police departments, or excuse me, the sheriff's departments for the counties, um, emergency management. And obviously some of this is restricted by the areas that are involved. Probably the biggest challenge in doing that are the tax rates. Uh, so if you're a county that has a lower tax rate and then there's another county supposedly probably next to you that has a higher tax rate and the uh, proposal is to combine the two of you, so if you're going to find an average somewhere in the middle there, that's going to be a struggle and probably not real popular with people who are going to have a higher tax rate because of the consolidation with the neighboring county who couldn't keep their levy lower. So there are all kinds of those challenges like that, that um, when people simply hear, hey, let's consolidate counties, they think that that's really simple, and it really is a very complicated thing to do. I mean, it couldn't be done. Um, and in fact, in, in Wisconsin, comparing it to another area, we used to have several thousand school districts in the state of Wisconsin, and now we have about 420, 22 maybe, right in that area. And so these things can happen but it, it is a complicated process. I, and I think a better thing to do would be to look at consolidation of services where we can save money instead. Thank you. We begin with the next question. Do you believe there are different challenges between those living in rural poverty from those living in urban poverty? If the issues are different, 
how should the difference, how should the state address those different rural poverty needs? Mon Lac County thinks it's urban, but it's a mix of urban and rural. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, what, poverty is not the same everywhere you go. Um, and when people think of poverty, uh, they, they oftentimes think of people kind of roaming the streets and ragged clothing and things like that. And that isn't really the case. The federal government sets what poverty means. Uh, and you can have much more in terms of your possessions than the picture I drew and still be considered in poverty. Uh, the challenges with rural poverty is that you are quite separated from the services that people who are living in poverty have available to them. Because oftentimes those services are centered in the county seat, such as the city of Fond du Lac for this county. Uh, and so a lot of the people who are in poverty have a tendency to kind of congregate in that area because of the, the proximity to those services. Uh, those that choose not to do that, that's a bit, much bigger challenge for them to have access to those services, and it's a much bigger challenge to be able to serve them with those services as well. Uh, as for the solution to the problem, um, I, I, that, that is a tough nut to crack. I mean, you know, people can live where they want to live, basically, and if some are choosing to live in an area that is separated from services that they need, uh, they are, in some cases, making a decision to make that more difficult. Now, I mean, we shouldn't try to reach those people, but it's obviously going to be harder. Uh, you know, things like medical transports and things like that are, are available, and the state operates some of those. The county operates uh, some systems like that as well, but the reach of them um, is limited, and it's limited by the amount of tax dollars that are available to serve them as well. So I, I, I truly believe that one of the reasons we have government is to help those who are in need, uh, and we should look to continue to do that. Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, as you had said, I, I think that Fondelac County as a whole is, is one of our greatest strengths is that we have a good mix between urban and rural communities, and, and I think that we, we use that to our advantage. Um, as far as how poverty affects the different areas, I mean, it, Jeremy's correct. It's about access. It's about uh, availability. When you're, when you're living in remote areas, um, that is a choice that they make, and it's not a choice that they should be should punished for. I, I don't think that they should have any less opportunity for the services than anybody living in the city. Um, a, a big part of the challenges for, for low income in those remote areas is having access and having choices. And I do think that the government can do more to get services out to them and expand accessibility to those, those <coughs> services. And you know, they pay their taxes just like everybody in the city. So I, I think we need to make sure that all the high quality services we get in town in the city are available by every corner of the county. Okay, this next question you'll start with. Do you believe Wisconsin has an opioid crisis? What should the state, Wisconsin state legislature do to assist those working at the local level and I guess you two could figure out where this one came from, to address issues of prevention, harm reduction, law enforcement, and treatment. Do we have a crisis? Again, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit uh, open interpretation, but I definitely think we have a, a looming problem on our hands and it definitely needs to be addressed. We definitely need to take a look at it. We, we need to take care of these things before it's a crisis. We can't, we can't always be reacting and we need to get ahead of it. So are opioids a problem in the community? I, I believe they are. I believe that um, there's more that we can be doing on the front end. We talk a lot about uh, treatment afterwards, and we need to talk about prevention in the first place. And I think that's an area where we can spend uh, more time. Uh, one of the proposals I've suggested is a, a seven-day prescription limit for the newly prescribed and acute pain. So that's a suggested limit. Um, Again, for, for the newly prescribed, so somebody that gets in a car crash, somebody that um, is not expecting to be on painkillers for an extended period of time, I think a seven-day limit allows them to uh, be reevaluated after a week. We don't need to be sending somebody home with a month's worth of uh, a month's worth of pills. I think that's dangerous. I think that uh, people recover at different rates, and 
someone may recover faster than someone else. And when you when you don't need the entire prescription, it's just out there in the world for potential to be abused, as often abused or stolen by the person that it wasn't prescribed to. So um, I would recommend controlling the supply. And that does not mean that we don't allow people to have access to it that need it or should have it. But it means not sending them home with, with too much that it could be dangerous. Thank you. Jeremy? I would say we definitely have an opioid crisis. Uh, and Pondelac is no exception in that regard. Uh, a question I've had sometimes from people who have perhaps family members or friends who are involved. I mean, there's hardly any of us who doesn't know somebody who has struggled with this. Uh, it's a very widespread issue. Uh, is it, where did it come from? Well, you know, we, we, have, we have pharmaceutical companies who have created some marvelous things that can be used to help people with pain and various conditions that they have in their lives. Uh, and sometimes when they are using these things, uh, especially if they use them for an extended period of time, uh, their bodies become reliant on it and an addiction occurs. Uh, and that's very difficult to break. Uh, one of the problems that we have is access to treatment. Uh, there, there are a limited number of treatment centers, uh, and being able, to, being able to get in them is quite a challenge sometimes. Uh, also, the lack of personal resources oftentimes for people who want to get into those treatment centers. And so as a state, uh, we need to look to do as much as we can within the reason uh, to be able to help these people out. And we have been doing quite a bit. I looked this afternoon, and there's, in the last three years, there have been 28 laws passed in the state legislature that either directly or indir indirectly deal with the opioid crisis uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, things such as showing proper ID, uh, immunity, if you call the authorities when you see that someone is going through some sort of an overdose, uh, drug disposal programs, expanded treatment and elder alternative diversion programs, uh, improved prescription drug monitoring programs, and the list could go on and on and on. Uh, so the state has been very active in this regard, and it's not over, so we need to continue to be active with it. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. You get this question. In Wisconsin, youth may legally drink in public with their parents. Do you believe this law should remain as is? Why or why not? Think, I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think Wisconsin is the only state that allows this practice. And I want to say yes. Uh, so that's 49, 49 out of 50 do it a different way. Now there are a few other things like that, but generally when you get a statistic like that, you kind of think <coughs> maybe that's something we should consider changing. Um, and, and I wouldn't be opposed to something like that if we were to change that law. But once again, what it's doing is taking authority away from parents. I am a strong believer that parents know what is best for their children. Now, it doesn't mean that parents should be going into bars with their children and handing shots over to them uh, and, and drinking right alongside them. And I, I realize that happens. But there are wider implications whenever you pass a law. Uh, it, that law takes in not only the people that you intend for it to take in, but it also takes in those who do not intend. Uh, and there are, there are families who, for whatever reason, have made decisions that they are going to supervise their children's drinking. Now, I didn't do that. Uh, my children were not supervised in drinking at my house. Uh, and it certainly seems like a very odd thing for our state to stand behind. Uh, so. We have this kind of culture in Wisconsin with the background of the breweries and all this, this kind of drinking culture. And I think that's kind of slowly changing as the years have gone by. And this is kind of a vestige left over from that. Uh, and so just to repeat, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have a problem with making that change. Um, but we also need to be careful because uh, parents need to be respected in the decisions that they make for their children. Uh, and this is one once again, one of those areas. Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, I, I don't think uh, agreeing with the other 49 states is some sort of 
government control issue. Um, I would I would agree that this is a, I would support changing the law uh, so that children are not drinking with their parents or without. I, I work in the hospitality business. I work in hotels and restaurants, and uh, the way the law is currently written, it's it's up to the property as well. The property can over uh, step beyond that and say even though you, you legally can, the property or the bar has the right to, to say you cannot. Um, and every establishment that I've been responsible at, um, we, we've said no, we're not going to have that because we do not need to be promoting alcohol abuse in this state. We have, you know, we often end up on the list for 10 out of the top 12 cities with the most alcohol consumption abuse, and that's not something that we should be proud of. That's not something that we should promote. Um, and, and I think changing that law is a very uh, reasonable step to, to combat that, and I don't see it as some kind of wild government oversight to agree with the other 49 states. Okay, thank you. You're going to begin with this question. Kevin, what is your position on the expansion of Highway 23 from Fond du Lac to Plymouth? How do you propose we fund projects and repairs to our roadways? Sure, my position is, is, is yes, we need to get that project done. It's been delayed for a long time. I understand that it has currently been delayed because of a lawsuit, and we, are, we opened ourselves up to that lawsuit by submitting an inadequate and incomplete environmental impact study because it was a popular uh, expansion, it was a popular project, so we kind of just filled it out, turned it in, and it opened us up to some opportunities for the lawsuit that we see now, and it's been delayed. Fortunately, it looks like we're going to move forward. I'm glad that we are. It's one of the most dangerous stretches of highway uh, in the state, and we can do something different about it. In terms of how we fund it, um, I feel this way about all infrastructure spending. It needs to be uh, more consistent um, year over year over year. What we tend to see with uh, infrastructure spending is, is sort of a uh, peaks and valleys, a staircase, if you will, of, you know, infrastructure is not where it should be. We need to invest a ton of money. Well, we just invested all this money. Everything's great. And we leave it alone for another 20, 30 years. And, again, these big steps and jumps are not effective. It should be more evenly distributed year over year. Um, the, the more money we put in infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of economic impact to be gained by that and, and in terms of transporting goods and services. So it's, it's almost always a good investment. And so we should increase our funding in infrastructure and it should be more consistent each and every budget. Okay. Jeremy? I would estimate the last four or five years, the Highway 23 expansion has been, if not the top, one of the top issues that um, has been percolating within the 52nd District. Uh, in terms of phone calls and the emails to my office, it ranks right up there as well. Uh, it, it's been well documented, the dangers of that road. I wouldn't be surprised if there are a few of you in here who avoid driving on that road. Uh, I know of people who turned down jobs in Sheboygan that had significant increases in pay for them because they did not want to drive on that road on a daily basis. Uh, so the road needs to be, needs to be reconstructed. Uh, and it's a major project and it costs an awful lot of money. The delays that we have seen uh, have ca caused the cost of the uh, job to increase that much more, obviously. But uh, we are delayed by the courts. And every time uh, I have sat down with other stakeholders in the community to try to come up with ideas of how we could get this project going, uh, whether it would be to break the project into smaller pieces uh, uh, or a myriad of other ideas, it has always come down to the fact that it would violate the order from a federal judge if we did any of those things. Uh, what Judge Edelman put forward at the request of the Thousand Friends of Wisconsin, an environmental group that I don't think is particularly friendly at all, uh, was an airtight decision that has put that road, uh, kept that road in the status it's in, and has put at risk the lives of people who have driven on it. I know people who have been injured and maimed on that road, uh, and I am upset that the Thousand Friends of Wisconsin has kept that project from being done. Thank you. We're going to begin with <coughs> another long one. So. <laughs> Annually, 2,600 kids become new daily smokers, 
and to nearly one third of Wisconsin high schoolers have tried e cigarettes. The FDA recently labeled e cigarette use among children an epidemic. What are some concrete steps the legislature can take to see the numbers decrease? Well, I think what is being done now uh, uh, just needs to be applied in a different area. You know, we, we have the, one of the sponsors of this debate is the uh, Five County Coalition, and they use public dollars to <coughs> the public, and they do go into the schools. They, they have little groups in the schools that meet periodically. I, I can remember it from when I taught at WLA. Uh, they, they, they put messages out on the sidewalk and things like that. And I, I've seen the cups and the, the fences where they do anti-smoking messages. So all, all of that stuff is what they do with the dollars that they collect, and some of those dollars are coming from the <coughs> tax uh, that is paid per tax in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as for the, the new thing, which is the vaping, or the electronic cigarettes, uh, that is a nicotine product, and children should not have <coughs> access to that. Our schools need to take that seriously, uh, and most of them have, and they have put regulations within their school codes that this is not a product that's allowed on school grounds. Uh, it also needs to be expanded to athletic codes to make sure that it's not being used by those who are competing in athletics no different than alcohol uh, or smoking is. Uh, that being said, you know, the, the product that is available for the electronic cigarettes is what I'm speaking of. Uh, there have been some good things that have come from this. Um, there have been people who have been addicted to nicotine, who have been able to wean themselves off it by using this. Uh, but on the other hand, we need to, like a lot of things, make sure that children aren't getting access to this. Uh, and the state should pay attention, uh, and if necessary, use some of that cigarette tax to apply to keeping this out of children's hands through education as well. Thank you. Kevin? Yeah, I think that uh, the e-cigarettes and vaping and all of those those products, if you see them in the store, you see them on the shelf, they're, they're practically being marketed to children. And they come in candy flavors, they come in bright colors, and they're, you know, it's, it's not getting treated the same way that we treat cigarettes, cigars, other tobacco products. And I, I think that the legislature uh, can do more about it. I think we can make sure that we are imposing the same restrictions that we uh, apply to cigarettes and how they're sold um, to these other tobacco products as well. That's not happening right now. It's, you, can, you can see the e-cigs, uh, you know, vape products um, on the shelf at checkout like it's gum or like it's candy and m and an impulse buy, and it's not. It's tobacco just like uh, any other cigar or cigarette uh, is out there. And I think that they, you know, you, you, you repackage it, you shape it differently, and, and you call it something new, it's not. So I think that companies have gotten away with dodging and deflecting um, those laws by calling it something different or trying to categorize it differently, and we can change that. So we can make sure that these are not marketed to kids, and we can make sure that we take it as seriously as we do cigarettes, because it is. Okay, thank you. Now, I'm going to hunt here and combine a couple of questions. A lot of good questions, but um, would you support the legalization of cannabis if yes, in what way? Sure, yeah, I, I would. I support uh, legalization of cannabis uh, for recreational or medicinal purposes. Um, I think there's a, there's a trend going around nationwide, and I think that's pretty obvious. And we've seen, it's not a test anymore. It's not an experiment anymore. We've seen the results uh, in other states um, that have led the way on this. Um, I think it's it's an adult only product, just like we talked about um, tobacco and e-cigarettes. This is an adult only product. It's a 21 or older product. Um, I think the medical benefits are uh, speak for themselves. I mean, um, the idea that it's still categorized as a Schedule One drug to me is wild. A Schedule One drug means that there's no benefit whatsoever, and we've seen video. We we've seen somebody suffering from seizures, no longer suffering from seizures. Period. The end. I mean, there, there is definitely medicinal purposes there. There's definitely a benefit to be had. Um, some folks want to talk about the revenue that we could generate from uh, marijuana. 
Um, for me, that's, that's true, that exists. Uh, but for me, it's really more about uh, cost savings and, um, and cracking down on nonviolent drug charges and, and the, um, the rate at which we you know, convict people and lock them up, and that, that can change. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Most people would split this between medical and recreational use. Uh, I am not in favor of recreational use, and I'll, I'll come back to that if there's time within the, the two minutes here. Uh, as far as medical use, the legislature has done some beginning work on that uh, with the CBD oil. Uh, and some of, the, some of the issues with that come because of the fact that the federal government has laws against uh, marijuana. And regardless of our opinion whether or not the federal government has authority to pass laws in that area, they have. And if you're going to, as a state, pass laws that are going to legalize marijuana within your state, you are violating federal law. And you have to understand that's part of this. Uh, as far as medical, you know, there, I think that there is some strong evidence that this can have a positive impact um, for seizures, which is what CBD oil is for, um, pain control as well. And we should look into that. I would be much more comfortable if we had some FDA approval on it. Um, because there's a reason that we use the FDA is for protection that we aren't getting rogue drugs and things like that out there. Uh, but as far as uh, recreational, uh, absolutely not. I, I do not see positive things coming out of this for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we were talking about vaping before it being marketed to children. Uh, the people who are pushing for <coughs> recreational, or excuse me, recreational marijuana have succeeded in making children think that this is no big deal. And, you know, some of the products out there that uh, I have seen that are marketed, essentially are marketed to children too with bright colors and all sorts of things like that. Uh, I, I was in California recently when I moved my daughter out there last summer and I saw billboards advertising for marijuana. Now, I didn't mean, know here. You, know, you can't do a billboard for cigarettes, but you can do one for marijuana. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, we'll, we'll begin with you, and this is again a combination of several questions on the same topic. Would you support a return to gas indexing to support building and maintaining Wisconsin bridge and road infrastructure? If not, what means of revenue would you support for funding Wisconsin infrastructure, and should we develop mass transit? Okay, well, let's deal with the funding portion of this. Uh, the gas indexing happened before I was in the legislature. It was around 2006, I think, in that area. Essentially what it used to be is that the gas tax automatically went up. Uh, I don't know if it was every year or every two years. Uh, it doesn't matter. It, it automatically went up. Uh, I supported that change at that time, and I still support it today. If, if you are a legislative body and you are going to raise taxes, <coughs> you should have to vote on it. There should be this automatic increase that goes forward every year, uh, and you, you do that by you know, just passing something that says it's just going to automatically go up. Now, you've got to have the courage to stand before the people and say, I increased your taxes. Now, some would say that that is what we need to do, is increase the gas tax. And I'm not in complete opposition to that, but our transportation fund, which is now protected because of work done by the Republican legislature. Uh, no longer can we divert money out of the transportation fund as was done prior to my time in the state legislature. It's in a lockbox, so to say. Uh, it is funded by a number of different things. Um, it's primarily the gas tax and, and the uh, fees from licenses. Gas tax is, you know, I don't know if antiquated is the right word, but we have cars now that don't use as much gas, which is a good thing. In fact, some that don't use any gas, electric cars. And so that has caused a dip in the gas tax revenue, uh, or at least it has not increased as it has in the past, and has caused some shortages. Now, the Department of Transportation right now, Secretary Ross, has said that he does not require any increase in transportation funds to do what he feels is necessary to maintain the roads in the state of Wisconsin. Okay. Thank you. 
Kevin. Yeah, I, I would not support increasing the gas tax. Uh, the other option that's been put out there is a toll system. I do not support a toll system either. I think that takes far too long to, to build the infrastructure required. Um, it's, it's just not necessary. In terms of how we do fund it, I mean, we talked about how we fund infrastructure, how we fund anything. We need to, the budget's all about priorities. It's what, you, what do we think we need to spend the money on? And there's a lot of money to be found in, in what we're giving away to corporations. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. We don't have money for this, we don't have money for that, but we have money to give away. So <coughs> it, it's about prioritizing your spending. Uh, the other part of your question that we didn't hear an answer to was, was uh, mass transit, and I think there's some really strong opportunities in that area. Um, Wisconsin you know, is uniquely positioned between Chicago and Minneapolis. Chicago and Minneapolis are right on our borders. And right now what we're seeing is a population of young people that leave Wisconsin to go to Minnesota, to go to Illinois. And instead, if we had some mass transit that made sense, that was effective, we got people coming from those places to Wisconsin and supporting the, the tax base that way. So I think Wisconsin has an incredible amount of potential and we need to make sure people can get here. And a big part of that is quality roads, and mass transit in the form of high-speed rail or other various options. So um, no gas tax, no tolls, more high-speed transit. Thank you. You're going to get this next question. What is your opinion concerning KFOs and their impact on groundwater? Should there be some revision to the state law to better regulate placement with standards in place to prevent runoff into streams as well as additional protections for groundwater? Yeah, we definitely need to protect our groundwater. We talked about the Great Lakes, we talked about Lake Winnebago, which was said earlier, I wouldn't want to drink out of it. Well, that's, that's an indicator to me that we're not doing the right thing. So we do use uh, wells instead of lake drawn water. Um, we need to protect our, our groundwater from runoff. And I think what often happens, and it's wrong, is we like to, not everyone, some people like to blame farms for the runoff and say that they're doing the wrong things. But I think, I believe strongly after talking to several farmers in the area, um, that they also want to prevent runoff. They also want to fight that. They're not, they're not the ones in the wrong here. They just need the help and the resources to do it. Um, so when it comes to whether it's rural farm runoff or factory runoff in the cities, um, we, just have to have, we just have to have a high standard in terms of what we allow and what we don't allow. And when we roll back regulation, you're opening yourself up to you know, contamination. So um, we need to work together with the rural and urban communities, with farms and factories to do the right thing to solve the problem. Um, they want us all just as much as we do. So. Okay, Jeremy? Well, just to make sure everybody understands what that question was in particular, the, the acronym CAFO is, if I remember correctly, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. In other words, it's really big farms. Uh, and we have some of these in the Bondi area. And essentially, they've been around for 10 plus years now, I mean 15 years, and this is the future of farming. Um, we are the dairy land state. Uh, farming is incredibly important in the state, multi billion dollar industry, uh, and we're dependent on it. And it's not just us, the rest of the world is using products from Wisconsin. And so, we need to maintain that, and we also need to grow it. Uh, the CAFOs are part of that process. Now, I, I have two have been on these farms, and I think if you have not been, they're, they're generally open to have you come and tour, so I would encourage you to do that. You would be impressed at the operations that these farms have. Uh, the, the farm that has thousands of cows is a cleaner operation sometimes than the farm down the road that has 25. Uh, and that, that, that's a fact. Now, it doesn't mean it always is, okay, but uh, these farms are highly regulated. And they follow those regulations as closely as they possibly can. When you, when you hear of a, a manure spill and things like that, you know, things like that are just going to happen from time to time. Uh, we need to make sure that these farms continue to produce the food that is necessary and the dairy products that are necessary in the state of Wisconsin and throughout the country. Uh, because what they are doing by e their efficient operation is they're keeping the cost of food down. 
In uh, the United States of America, we have some of the lowest costs for food in the world, uh, and that certainly is a positive thing for our, for our state and our nation. Thank you. Kevin? Did you? Did I? Did I you did I did, well. See, you know what's going on. This is going to be our last question. Sure. Okay. But because we started late, because we had microphone issues, what I'd like to do for the one minute closing is um, if it's okay with you, um, have Jeremy do the first closing and have you do the second. That kind of gets us out of order. That's fine. That's okay. I really need to do this one. All right, thank you. So Jeremy, you get this question. You're gonna end the night on a, <laughs> a question. And I, again, it's a combination. Of, and I'm gonna invert it. Is healthcare a right? And uh, should all people have access to the same health care that you all have in the legislature? Okay, health care as a right would be a new concept in the United States of America. I, I think the first thing you need to do is you define, need to define what is a right. Uh, you know, we hear things about the freedom of speech as being a right, so the right to, care, uh, to bear arms is a right. Um, the right to assemble, and, you know, the list could go on. One thing that you'll note with all of those rights is that they don't cost somebody else any money. So my freedom of speech does not cost Kevin here any money. It doesn't cost anybody in here any money. My right to bear arms does not cost anybody else any kind of monetary value whatsoever. So if you're going to start ascribing rights to things that have monetary value to them, you are essentially forcing other people to pay for your rights. And that's what's going on with health care. Now, that's, this may be the direction the American people have decided to go. Now, I, I voted on a bill in the legislature last session to uh, cover pre-existing conditions, which is one of those things that people say health care is a right are, are saying is a necessity, because I think we should try to do that. But to take it as a right uh, goes beyond the definition that I have always understood a right to be. Uh, and so I, I am not interested in saying that I have a right to health care, and then because I have that right, everybody else in this room has to pay for it. Uh, that is not a concept that we should be applying across the spectrum in the United States. And I can tell you right now, if we're going to start looking at health care as a right, what's going to be the next thing that's going to become a right also? I, I prefer to stick to rights as the things that we find in the United States Constitution. Thank you, Jeremy. Kevin? Well, the answer is yes. We have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In my opinion, uh, having your health care covered in a developed nation that we can, I think we do have the right to health care. And we certainly should have access to the health care that the state legislature gets. You know, they're taking care of, they're covered, but they don't want to stand there and say that, that, uh, that you're not. Uh, I think that's wrong. I think it is a new concept, as Jeremy said, to the United States, but it's not a new concept to the world. There are developed nations in every hemisphere that have done this, and they've done this successfully. They didn't collapse into some kind of economic downturn. Um, and we won't either. And we're moving in that direction. People understand that we can, will, and should be taking care of each other. What, what greater purpose does government have than to pursue the life, liberty, and pursue happiness and protect each other because we're capable of doing it. Some people don't have to go without so that somebody else can go with. And, for me, that's, that's the simple answer. I mean, healthcare can, should, and will be a right for everyone. Okay, thank you. We are going to begin our closing remarks. The audience will hold their applause. Thank you. We're going to begin with um, closing remarks. They each get one minute to tell us why voters in the 52nd Assembly District should vote for them. We'll begin with Jeremy, and we will finish with Kevin. I'll wrap things up here tonight by once again thanking everybody for coming and thanking for the moderators of the moderator uh, of the forum here tonight. When I first joined the legislature in 2011, Wisconsin was in a pretty grim condition. 
That is no longer the case. <clears throat> a couple weeks ago, I saw a presentation by the chief economist for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, works at the Department of Revenue. He's a gentleman who has worked for both Republican and Democrat administrations. And he went through a presentation where he showed 12 widely, uh, widely known economic indicators. Every single one of those economic indicators, the state of Wisconsin was in the positive end and moving forward, and in some cases at record pace. That's the difference that has happened since 2011 when myself and my colleagues got into the legislature. There is more of the same ahead, and I would like to have your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Kevin? As I said at the top, I'm humbled to be considered for the opportunity to represent you, and I think it's critical that we remember that. The government and our leaders, they are our representatives. Uh, they work for us and not the other way around. And the government is no longer reflecting your values, then it's time to elect a new government. I believe that we are so close to reaching our full potential here in Wisconsin, but we need to see past our differences long enough to do it. We need to talk to people that we don't necessarily agree with, and not just talk to each other, but actually hear each other. It's only then that we can move forward in the next chapter of Wisconsin, where Wisconsin is a leader in the Midwest again. My name is Kevin Booth, and I humbly ask for your vote on November 6th for the opportunity to represent you in Madison. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, candidates. Thank you, audience. You had magnificent questions. Remember, the election to determine the, the winner of the 52nd Assembly District is Tuesday, November 6, 2018. And now you may applaud as much as you like.